All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you all for being here on this very wet and uh, rainy Monday. My name is Anuj Gupta. I'm the uh, Deputy City Manager and Director of Policy for the City of Santa Monica. And uh, we are delighted here to welcome Steve Goldsmith and Kate Coleman to Santa Monica for this special event, Mapping the Future, Leadership in Search of a sen Sense of Place. And this event is co-hosted by the Pepperdine School of Public Policy's Project for Cross-Sector Leadership and the City of Santa Monica. Um, we'll be hearing a little bit later from uh, the Dean of uh, Pepperdine School of Public Policy, Pete Peterson, uh, who will be helping to moderate a conversation with um, our guests. And then, of course, our city manager, Rick Cole, will close us out uh, towards the end. But we are here today to talk about cross-sector collaboration. And actually, this event itself is really what this is all about. Uh, we have a city and a leading academic institution coming together uh, to exchange ideas and explore solutions to some very complex challenges. So I want to begin by introducing our two special guests today. Uh, first, Steve Goldsmith is the Daniel Paul Professor of the Practice of Government and the Director of the Innovations in American Government Program at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. He directs the Data Smart City Solutions Project, which studies the local government use of new technologies and big data analytics to reshape the relationship between government and citizen. Steve also served as the Deputy Mayor for Operations uh, of New York City under Mayor Bloomberg and previously served two terms as the mayor of Indianapolis from 1992 to 2000. Uh, he also was the chief domestic policy advisor to George W. Bush's uh, presidential campaign in 2000, and then went on to serve in his administration as the director or chair of the Corporation for National and Community Service. Now, uh, Steve has written a number of books on local government and innovation, including Governing by Network, The New Shape of the Public Sector, which uh, I'm told is a Rick Cole favorite. Um, a New City OS, The Power of Open, Collaborative, and Distributed Governance, and his forthcoming book, Mapping the Future, Leadership in Search of a Sense of Place, which is the subject of today's talk on the role of spatial analytics and locational intelligence in solving urban challenges. And he's working on this book with uh, Kate Coleman, our other guest today. Kate has served as Executive Vice President and Chief Strategy and Advancement Officer of the YMCA of the United States and is also a former fellow at Harvard's Advanced Leadership Initiative, where she worked on how to scale social impact and overcome obstacles to nonprofit efficiency and effectiveness. Now, Steve and Kate both actually have strong ties to all of us here today. Um, Steve's daughter lives here in Santa Monica. Uh, she couldn't be with us today, but she um, also is an alum of Pepperdine, so she's, got, uh, she's the twofer in terms of this collaboration here. And I understand Kate's son also went to Pepperdine Law School, so uh, we've got a lot of, uh, a lot of the waves uh, in, in, in the blood here at today's event. Now, in addition, I should mention that Steve has also been a coach and a champion for the city of Santa Monica's well-being work. Um, Julie, uh, our chief civic well-being officer, is here. Uh, he recently wrote in Governing Magazine, quote, the city's approach, the city being us, uh, Santa Monica, is a, is a continuing and evolving one, showing that when local officials have a clear vision of community goals, array public services to produce that vision, and then measure the results, they can create genuine new value to their residents. Now, any of my colleagues uh, deep in the thick of the work to reimagine our city's budget can attest to how continuing and evolving that work is. Uh, but it's, it's a work in progress that we're uh, excited to, to move forward on and, and inspired by the leadership of thinkers such as Steve. Now, getting back to the subject of today's talk, I must note that here in Santa Monica, we're in the midst of an innovative project to think across sectors about the unique place that we are in and the thriving economy that has enabled us to remain such a desirable place to live, work, visit, and learn. Amid exponential changes in artificial intelligence, user options, and connectivity, which are disrupting the way that we work, we move around, and disrupting retail as well, locally and globally, we are working proactively in the city of Santa Monica to develop a strategy to address the opportunities and threats that these disruptive forces pose and we're seeking an innovative collaboration along the lines of what you'll hear both Steve and Kate discuss today. So I can't help but put in a plug. We've just released a request for proposals for our economic sustainability strategy project. We're actually holding a pre-submission conference tomorrow morning, so a little short notice, I know. Uh, but we have uh, some postcards, I believe, at the check-in desk, which have some more details and a link. You can talk to me, um, to my colleagues, Andy Agel, Julie Wedig, uh, Jennifer Taylor, uh, Jason Harris in the room afterwards if you want more information about our project, but it's actually a, a, a nice fit for the subject of our conversation today. Uh, but that's enough for me. Um, we are all excited to hear from our special guests. I think Kate's going to go first, 
and then Steve. So please join me in welcoming both Kate Coleman and Steve Goldsmith as we map the future. book together and it's completely unclear to us whether we're going to make it another year to do this again so that's the kind of thing I can <laughs> yeah but I can am I am I on or am I just talking loudly I'm on good um, so first of all thank you I am delighted to be here to join you I am delighted to be Steve's opening act and so before we go to the main event that would be my darling spouse I want to give you a little bit of, can you see that? It's kind of hard to see, isn't it? Um, a little bit of background about how we got here. So as Anoush mentioned, we're working on this book. And this book was born out of, as you can imagine, OK, the other thing, very liberal Democrat, <laughs> Republican. So you can imagine it's always conversation all the time in our house. But this, this book grew out of ongoing conversations that we have had about creating social value in different domains, policy domains. Me always with my sort of nonprofit lens, Steve with his government lens. And we finally kind of stepped back and said to ourselves, you know what, we've got decades invested in this. And we have both kind of come to the same place which is that the complex problems that face our cities, our rural areas for that matter, really exceed the capacity, right, of any one agency, any one organization, any one sector to address. And so we began to think about, well, what are the ways about working together given the tools that are now emerging and so we began to look at locational intelligence as a possible tool for fostering cross-sector collaboration now. I don't know, is there anyone from Pepperdine, Pepperdine here? Because I want to use a little language. We think we're at a Cunian moment. Does anybody know what a Cunian moment is, right? Well, in, in the history of science, a Cunian moment is when all the evidence begins to pile up and pile up and the old way of doing things no longer satisfy, and you begin to move to a new paradigm. And we think we are actually in a kind of Cunian moment for cross-sector collaboration, in part because the tools are better, but also, and as you know from being in, in Santa Monica, we're beginning to think in systems terms. And there's a greater openness to new organizational forms that simply do not look like the old forms that we're used to. So here's what we'd like to do. Now, Stephen, dearest, you may want to tell me to talk faster because you know I have a tendency. OK, so what we're very briefly going to do, I'm going to talk a little theory. And then we're going to look at applying locational intelligence to the different phases of collaboration formation, operation, and adaptation, and then kind of give ourselves a reality check because, in, in fact, one needs to do that. There's a lot of research out there, academic research, about collaboration. I will say to you, from my perspective, and I don't know, Pete, you may know this far better than I, it is largely descriptive rather than prescriptive. And it's very difficult to draw any conclusions beyond saying everybody recognizes there's the need for it, nobody's certain how to make it work, and so far success is mixed. And so what we want to do is introduce some tools to maybe change the calculus. The problems that we're dealing with, you've heard the expression wicked problems, sometimes they're called grand challenges. This nomenclature is about 40 years old. Of course, the problems aren't wicked because they're immoral. The problems are wicked because they're complex. They're composed of underlying intersecting issues. So when you think about homelessness, it's not just homelessness, it's evictions and gentrification and mental health and so I could go on. 
with that kind of complexity, oh, and the other thing is they're constantly evolving. So with that kind of dynamic and complex situation, you can see that no single policy solution is going to work. You need to think largely across domains. So I hope I've made that. I want to add one other thing about the context, and this is important. I don't need to, the top sort of two boxes reiterate what I said there. But here's the other thing that factored into our calculus as we thought about what were tools that would help the sectors work together better, and that is people experience problems in place. It may be the function of a multitude of different systems, but I experience it in my home, in my house, in my community. And so when we think about addressing those issues, thinking about them in terms of agencies and sectors doesn't acknowledge the profoundly important role of place in the collaborative process. I I think most of you will know these advantages, so I'm not going to focus on them other than to say there are a couple of interesting things. Obviously coordination, obviously rationalization. The two things that we're finding particularly interesting is this notion of legitimacy. And when you kind of work into the community, get information from the community, engage the community, it has, and no offense to you guys, no offense, it has a kind of legitimacy that sometimes government doesn't have. The other one is innovation, and everybody talks about innovation, it's one of those sexy words, but here's the interesting thing. When you have multiple players, they are constantly feeding in new information, and it's new information that comes from their lenses. That process, of my negotiating with Anoush what the information means creates a kind of new information or new knowledge that then can be repurposed and tends to be repurposed in very innovative ways. Now, all that having been said, it is not easy to collaborate. It is not easy to bring multiple players who have their own point of view and their own business systems and their own norms and their own culture and their own name, nomenclature to the table and expect it to work smoothly. It just doesn't happen. However, and again, I'm not <coughs> suggesting that there is a magic bullet here. I am not doing that. However, there are absolutely categorically digital tools right now which allow us to lay multiple data sets one on top of another and create a visual picture. And my favorite, we've done interviews. We spoke to a guy from the Princeton uh, uh, eviction lab, and his, he said, you can layer a lot of data on one piece of paper in a map without creating cognitive overload. Right, that's exactly right. If you had to process in a million spreadsheets what you can layer onto a map, you would just throw your hands up. So the power of these maps then is creating a window into a place that different players have to interpret so that they can begin to develop a common understanding of a problem, which is the step that absolutely must come before you decide what your collaborative aims and agenda and theory of action are. I'm going to keep going. So a few definitions before I show you maps and turn it over to the main event. Oops, excuse me. Um, as you know, collaboration takes many forms. I'm a purist. I want it to be formal. Steve's, let's just give him an example, and, and, and we'll take a kind of looser definition. But they range all the way from informal to quite formal. So you may have community group getting together to build a park in a particular location, and then they disperse once the park is built. So that's transactional and very informal. Everything to the collective impact initiatives, which all of you have, have no doubt heard about, where they have very formal structures and processes, and sometimes become institutionalized and actually become an organization or an approach in and of themselves. So all different forms. 
Irrespective, however, of their forms, they tend to go through a series of stages, formation, operation, and adaptation. And so we're going to talk about each of those um, in, in, in order. And I'm going to actually talk about formation because that's where I'm least dangerous. And before I do, just a teeny weeny bit more theory and then I promise just to be practical. So if you look at the research, most researchers identify something called they, what they call antecedent conditions. These are conditions the presence of which either create a favorable or an unfavorable environment for a collaboration to form. So think government regulations or mandates. Remember Hope 6, Promise Zones, right? Those were mandates that forced a kind of collaboration. Or you can have economic incentives, right? When you think about dedicated funding streams, is, isn't that your, is your Prop H or Prop Triple H or something, right? That's a dedicated, I'm from Chicago. There's a, a large foundation there called the MacArthur Foundation, and they are funding, funding, funding cross-sector collaboration. So that can create a favorable environment. However, however favorable the environment might be, in the absence of certain drivers, it is unlikely that collaboration occurs. And those drivers tend to be things like a leader who can make the case or create a sense of urgency or certain kinds of incentives or a group of powerful sponsors. Let's say for the purposes of our remaining discussion that we have made the case for a collaboration and we're trying to bring the partners together to the table. Once we've identified them, we convene them. Their number one task is actually to negotiate their preliminary aims, their agenda, their institutional form, their theory of action. This changes, but that's sort of the number one task of formation. That cannot happen, however, if they aren't on the same page about the definition of the problem, that they have had some discussion about cause and effect, about symptoms, so that prior to negotiating their preliminary aims, there is a period of problem exploration. And that's what I want to show you some maps that were designed to do that. So I'm going to now switch gears. These are maps from LA. And they're not perfect. I just wanted to show them to you so that you could begin to get a sense of the elements that might go into those early stages of a collaboration where you get a group of disparate partners around the table thinking about the problem and trying to come to consensus. So this map shows where pe homeless people are living all over the uh, LA area in different communities. However, that's not particularly granular. And if you're trying to come to a common understanding of the problem, you're going to have to go down a level. These maps, and I apologize, you can't really see them, show where people are, homeless people are living in emergency shelters, in vans, on the street. So now we've gone down a level of granularity. And in addition to that, so these are people living in emergency shelters, going down a well then, it's looking at the demographics and also the percent of them demonstrating certain risk factors, whether it's PTSD, I'm, I'm not going to go into that. But what you can see here is the beginning of a framing of the problem in a way that the players can begin to talk the same language. Here's another example just of the same thing. So we've talked about them being to, uh, looking at where homeless are. These maps actually demonstrate by risk factor where people are most likely to become homeless. Again, it's another slice on the problem. And then these maps are a series of maps. And again, I don't know if we can get the link to you. It, this is actually really interesting and I thought relatively powerful. These maps are where uh, resources could be located depending on 
different policy objectives. So one of them is put resources where there are the most homeless, or put resources where the people are at the greatest risk of becoming, or put ro uh, resources where the people are more vulnerable, vulnerable based on 311 calls and other kinds of things. Anyway, they're not perfect, but what you can begin to see is they convey a lot of information that creates dialogue and understanding across players. Obviously, you could add all sorts of other things, resources, stakeholders, but I just wanted you to see them. And then back to my point of trying to think about it on spreadsheets, that's some of the underlying data sets. Never are you going to be able to do that in, through Excel, no matter how clever a chart drawer you are. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to my darling spouse. <laughs> You want this thing? Hmm? Would you like this? Uh, no, I'll take. That's okay. Right. I'm I'm going to resist the uh, opportunity to uh, defend myself because it was to come into Santa Monica and have Kate label label herself accurately as a very very liberal person and me as a Republican is just like a totally unfair start. Right? <laughs> I mean, I gotta tell you one, real, one really little quick story, then we'll, we'll finish up. So I was deputy mayor of New York. I lived up uh, in Harlem, uh, I, and uh, my boss, Mike Bloomberg, made us, register, made us vote, of course, um, because we lived there. And I, I, I went in to vote on primary day, uh, not far from where I lived. And I was the first voter in line, and I, I walked in, the, and a very nice woman greeted me. And she said, hello, and I said, um, I like a Republican ballot. And she looks around, she looks around, she looks around, she goes, we've never had one of your type here before, right? So anyhow, she did, she did in the end provide me a sample ballot because they had, they had received no Republican ballots that, that primary. At any rate, so I, thanks for the uh, label. Um, let me just real quickly deal with that. So the basic setup that, that Kate went through in addition to kind academic literature is, is the following, right? We have really difficult, wicked problems, right? We have this increasing economic disparity and problems of homeless and other wicked problems. And so they seem to be uh, uh, almost overwhelming. But at the same time, we have a whole new set of digital tools. And the question becomes how those digital tools, particularly mapping, can allow us to approach and solve these problems, A. And B, the, and, and the, the, the diagrams Kate showed presented in terms of advantages and disadvantages that a collaboration can be really good if it's tightly organized and around a central mission and you have operating standards and, and you're going to measure performance, or it can actually be more fragmented. So, right, so how do the digital tools help us manage that differently? And I've just got a couple kind of examples here as we get started. Um, that light is really difficult to read. So the basic, uh, as is this guy's hands are, um, on the left, Right, so just think about it, thank you, think about it this way. Um, uh, uh, I've been in local government for actually 30 years as district attorney and mayor, deputy mayor, and, uh, and governments, particularly governments as well run as Santa Monica's, are very professional. But we have a very old operating system, which is a bureaucratic, hierarchical, command and control, routinized form of government, not except in Santa Monica, Rick, where things are much better, but generally, that's the way they are. They're reactive, they're routinized, and they're task-based, right? But the new system, the new collaboration, allows us to coordinate uh, delivery, uh, uh, rationalize the dollars, and we have open and democratized information, and we can have predictive analysis. So let's start. And these are just examples to kind of um, uh, provoke a little bit of thinking. So I'm, uh, as with Kate's presentation, not going to explain them in, in great detail. One is coordinated delivery. Right? I've been involved in the world of child protective services for decades. Um, I don't think there are very many jobs in local government more difficult than a CPS worker who knocks on the door of a troubled family and tries to decide whether to take the child from the family or not. And, and, there are, and th these workers are at a huge disadvantage, right? Whether they're contracted workers like in New York City or whether they're state workers or county workers like in California, they're at a huge disadvantage because they're, they're walking in with pieces of paper and clipboards and maybe now even digital kind of um, um, uh, notebooks. 
But really what the system would say is if we're going to have a coordinated delivery system, we're going to figure out how we're going to share information privately and securely among the school, right, and the, and the police authorities and the medical authorities and the uh, parents or foster parents and how we're going to use that data and data analytics to drive to the person who's doing the field work, whether a nonprofit worker or a city worker, we're going to drive her to her uh, uh, the data in decision support systems that help her ask the right questions and help her know what's going on. So point one is coordinated delivery in a spatially organized and digital world will allow for more coordinated delivery and better decision making on the street. Second um, would be, oh, I, I wanted to mention, I was gonna do this at the end, but um, you know, we're sensitive to the fact that, um, that there's a lot of really remarkably good work going on in Santa Monica. And whether uh, the work that uh, Julie Rusk has done with Rick on well-being, right, that's by definition a collaboration, right? It's not, not like the city can make life good without the individuals themselves and their neighborhoods uh, involved and their families and their doctors and their air quality and the like. And the economic sustainability RFP, I, uh, the words are there for later, but it, by definition, it's economic sustainability means how does the collaboration work, how does it involve the residents and the like. So as we talk about uh, how to do this, I think, I think the Santa Monica uh, experiences are particularly interesting because they, they say, and I didn't know you, uh, you were going to read that piece out of governing that I wrote because you, I, that's the same thing I have there in the headline. <laughs> I was going to pretend it was original, but it basically said that you know if you have city priorities and you have coordination and collaboration, you can create you can create public value. So now let's move on a little bit, right? So if we think about collaboration, it's also important that we think about collaboration with residents themselves, not just nonprofit to nonprofit and government to nonprofit, but how do folks participate? And this is just a little way to suggest how these digital tools might work, right? Well, blight in Detroit, um, and there uh, there are very few cities that have enough code inspectors, right, and they have, that have enough, uh, particularly in cities like Detroit, that have enough t people to respond to the problems. So how do you think about democratizing open information as driving collaborations? Well, one way is you basically say we're to residents, take a picture of the problem you see and upload it to the city site, and we're going to have the individuals in our cities will become the sensors for solving these problems. So if we think about open if we think about the operation of a collaboration, that operation can be augmented and facilitated through tools like this, and this is just one from Detroit, and there are other cities like New Orleans that have done the same thing. Or they can be how folks handle their apps on their phones to report issues or uh, cite a person who's in, in need of assistance. This is the original kind of 311 app that many of you know about that came from Boston, uh, where citizens are reporting in real time. And then this is... Um, uh, this, this is a little bit old now, but I did it, so I wanted to talk about it. Um, so, you know, in, uh, in um, New York City, as we went from, you know, gray infrastructure to green infrastructure and solving um, issues with uh, combined sewer overflow and other uh, issues with respect to wastewater, the question became, you know, how would you handle water runoff? Well, it's a good question today in Santa Monica, but it's a real, it's an everyday question in other parts of the country. And so the, the professionals in the, in the um, department of uh, the, the, the water department in New York City said, well, look, we'll just identify the really wet areas in New York City and we'll design an engineering response in those communities, right? So that sounds like a really quite professional thing to do, but, but is it really the right thing to do? So instead we got them to, to say this, we're gonna map where those problems are in the city of New York and we're gonna ask the community groups what suggestions do you have? Do you want a little swale? Do you want uh, more trees planted? What, what could you do to absorb more runoff water in your community? And, and we will take your ideas. Now, the ideas wouldn't work without the planners suggesting where the wet areas are, but the planners don't know as much as folks do in the community, and this is just a way to engage them. So the whole point here is that, uh, is that real-time data, digitally involved, powers collaborations in a way that were never possible before. And um, I think the LA Geo Hub, which allows the, 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 as does Santa Monica, the ability to organize public data geographically will drive um, these collaborations without me doing it, I think. Um, 
this is a little sensitive because it's a police slide, but, but I want to use it to make a, a point here. Um, in New York City, a billion records are available to a police officer. I mean, a billion records, right? And, th and you could, th when you look at this, think about whether you are a, a, a caseworker, a neighborhood worker, or a police officer. That information does not become usable until it has context. And context is most relevant locationally. So uh, this slide just suggests that this off these officers on the street uh, are receiving on their, um, essentially their smartphones, the information from those billion records, right, uh, warrant records, uh, citizen uh, messaging, call sensor, video analytics of, uh, uh, you know, there's cameras everywhere in New York City. That stuff is all taken and sent to the officer, and that, uh, these officers see that information as it relates to their beat, their precinct, right? There's a wanted car that just came over the Brooklyn Bridge that will be in your precinct shortly. So, so the point of this is that location matters a lot. Context produces values, value, and we have an opportunity with digital systems to organize that around the needs of whoever the field worker is. And it's not just uh, that we want to take information that's old, we want to take information in real time. This is Chicago's air sensors, right? So, you know, it's one thing to react to somebody after they've received, uh, uh, after they have asthma because the air quality in their neighborhood is really bad, right? Or after they have a problem because the lead in their water is really bad, or after they have a problem because the lead in their paint is really bad. This says that this organization of collaboration with digital tools in real time should send sensor data, data that alerts us in advance of the time that somebody uh, has these problems. And then finally, this information will allow us to iterate, right? Uh, allow, this is a new sense of, new definition of professionalism, a professionalism that says we are going to apply as government professionals or nonprofit professionals the skills we've learned in order to listen better to the community, curate their information and do it as well. So these feedback loops uh, help us iterate in real time. You know, government has for too, too long, even the most progressive governments, responded to information that is backward facing, not forward facing, not preemptive and predictive, but reactive. So um, you're going to close. I was, but you're welcome to. Now come on up. <laughs> this is, we've been writing a lot, but we don't speak together in front of an audience. We speak together, but not in front of an audience. So uh, uh, Kate's going to close with, some, uh, with one final thought, and then uh, we'll uh, have the discussion with Pete. So, so in fairness, we have given you bits and pieces of what could be, and, and some pieces of what, what is. But we are mindful, right, that there's a long way to go here. And we haven't even talked about issues right around privacy and security, all of which need to be dealt with. But, but what I would like to say is that kind of in this survey that we have done over the past six months or so, here are some of the conclusions that we've reached. We absolutely categorically continue to believe in the power of these digital tools and locational intelligence to act as a catalyst to collaboration, to help with their operation, and to be a source of data so that solutions can be iterated. So that we have not changed at all. What we see is that most of the action and the application of these tools is in the operations phases. We've seen much less of it being used as a tool for formation possibly more in the adaptation phases. If you were to ask us where we think the real power could be, I think there's huge power in adaptation. So walking in the door with a point of view, executing it, and then integrating new knowledge into the process so that you can iterate your solutions is precisely what you need when you consider the dynamic nature of the problems most of these collaborations are formed to address. And then the final thing that, that I would say we've observed, and I think this is both positive and negative, the technology is there. And, and I think we would say that the will is there. What is absent are resources, 
and bandwidth and time. Steve, you want to add anything to that? No. Is that the closing comment? That is. Wait a minute. I've got, I have one thing to add. Oh. So um, this is my last book. And uh, uh, the, the book we're writing won't be out for another four or five months. So if you're uh, tantalized and want more detail, it would, direct, it would definitely help my sales if you go purchase the new City OS available on Amazon. And Kate and I thank you very much for your time and attention and, we, and your interest. Well, uh, good afternoon. My name is Pete Peterson, and I am Dean of Pepperdine School of Public Policy. And with that many P's, it's good to have uh, about 15 or 20 feet of room between me and the front row, uh, as I tend to project a little. Um, first, I want to thank Rick Cole for uh, making this collaboration possible. Kate, as you said at the beginning, this is a bit of a cross-sector collaboration in and of itself. And in that, it is bringing many of my own personal worlds together. I am a Santa Monica resident. I've lived here for about a dozen years. My wife is fourth generation Santa Monican, and uh, her grandfather was in the first graduating class at Sam High. Um, so at the same time, I am dean of the Graduate Policy School here. And one of the phrases that we use at Pepperdine is that we're about putting the public back into public policy. Uh, these graduate policy schools tend to be very technocratic in the way that they teach future leaders. And uh, the, the reason that I'm such a huge fan of yours, Steve, and now yours, Kate, is that you understand the, the citizen's role as it relates to public policy. And that, that role can be explored both as an individual, as you showed there in, in providing data, but also in collaboration with others, whether it's uh, working through a nonprofit organization or a private sector uh, organization, uh, so much of the focus of your work has been in uh, connecting citizens to uh, public policy. So it's a real great honor uh, to be with uh, you both, and it's a, a great honor to be here. So the format for the rest of uh, our time together is I'm going to ask just a couple questions, but I'm hoping that you're beginning to think through a few questions yourself. We want to conclude with some uh, questions from the audience. Uh, a lot has been put on the table here. So I, I, I wanted to delve into a couple uh, items, especially as it relates to culture. Um, one of the things I don't think you talked a lot about, just given uh, the time constraints, were some of the things that you saw in your surveys. Uh, I'm sure there was also some focus group work and individual one-on-one -on -one, uh, interviews and conversations. And I, one of the things that we talk a lot about at Pepperdine is it's not just about the skills of public engagement and working across sector. Uh, there has to be a certain culture of leadership, whether you're coming as a, a government leader, a nonprofit leader, or a business leader, uh, to be willing to engage. And I wonder if there was something that you saw uh, some indicators in in the cultures or leadership styles of where this work can happen most effectively and maybe some warning signals that if you were looking to engage with another sector that you saw some things that uh, made you question whether this was actually going to be effective or not. Well, um, so my, my lens generally is government as the catalyst um, government as the organizer of a network of services, sure. right? It, if you're in one of these networks, you think you're, 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 you always think you're at the center of the network. But when you're in government, sometimes you are actually in the center of the network. Mm. Kate may have a different perspective from her work as the head of, a, of, of strategy and planning for a, you know, a 20 million person organization with a lot of decentralization. 
So um, let me try to answer your important question quickly. Um, let me t let me start with where it had where one place it originally didn't work. So I run the Innovations American Government Program at Harvard. We give awards. Uh, Pete serves on the um, uh, advisory board to that program. Uh, X years ago, we gave an award to an important uh, Hispanic organization in New York City that partnered with the New York City Parole or Probation Department in order to help uh, uh, persons who were released from prison uh, integrate back into the communities and not recidivate. It seemed like a great plan. The problem was the, lo the community organization's goal was to keep, uh, primary goal was to keep the folks out of prison. And if there was a minor infraction, failure to report or whatever, uh, they wanted to, to just make it go away, right? Because the, the, everybody was better off in their opinion if, if, if the guy stayed out of prison. The probation and parole officer said, look, we got a job. Our job is to enforce the rules. These guys broke the rules. They go back, right? So you've got an, you have a collaboration, a formal collaboration with a huge cultural difference, right? And if you, and the more organization, the more organizations you add to the collaboration, the more risk you have. And, and I've, you know, I've, as mayor, have seen a lot of collaborations which are in name only. Like, okay, we, we do this set of things. You want us to collaborate. We'll say we're going to collaborate. Now we're not going to change anything we do, right? And, we, and, and, if, and it's always the other guy's, you know, he, the other guy's the one that should, should bend a little bit. So, so my, my answer is, and you can't, you can't manage a, a collaboration by ordering everybody around either, right? So, so it's the clarity of the mission, it's the negotiation, uh, as Kate mentioned, uh, it's, it's the original negotiation of what the problem is. I thought the, uh, one of the great slides that Kate uh, showed me the other day in preparing for this was, okay, you're gonna map the problem or you're gonna map, where the, uh, map the prediction of the problem? You're gonna map the problem as it relates to veterans? You're gonna map the problem as it relates to young folks, right? You're gonna map the problem as it relates to domestic violence or are you gonna, right? And so just the, the negotiation of the meaning, but, but, but second to that, and I know, you know uh, Rick is one of the leaders in the country, which is just performance management, right? So what are the metrics that are gonna, that, that will cascade across the organization and those metrics will drive cultural changes. So if you have leadership at the top, you have a clear mission, you have, an, you have a spatial uh, a view that, that gives a common narrative, and then you measure and, and you have a, a, a commitment to do it, you can get over those cultural differences. But if they're not negotiated at the front end, they will, they will cause real trouble in the, in the whole thing. Kate, I wanted to swing it to you. Can I just add one thing to yeah. go to Steve's? And that yep. is, because I was going to focus on negotiating. It's not just negotiating up front. It's negotiating on a constant basis mm. because it's that creation. I said it before, and I sound like a calm person. <laughs> But it, it, but it is that constant sort of back and forth about what constitutes reality that actually allows the partners to see into one another's heads. Mm. You know, I, and I want to build on that because in, in the last slide of the presentation, and I may have misread the bullet point, but what I thought I read was the, the use of maps to... Uh, demonstrate and illustrate information, policy information, was most effectively used by cross-sector collaborations that were already working together. And I wonder if you foresaw the use of these platforms as a way of bringing together sectors that maybe had not been working together, that they could actually facilitate relationships in a way that other ways of of uh, illustrating or demonstrating data, the scope of the problem where you could, where these maps could really bring people together and say this is uh, the scope of it and this is how we can work together. Can they be used to convene sectors? Well, so I did a, this is kind of sad. <laughs> I did a poor job up front. <laughs> that, it's just me as a bad audience no, member. No, no, okay. no, 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 I'll own it. That's, that is the whole point of that notion around formation mm. and using that, the maps when you convene the groups to come to a common understanding because the theory suggests if you can't come to a common understanding, you're never going to get those preliminary aims down. If you're never going to get those preliminary aims down, you're never going to get moving. Mm. Mm. Now, ask the question, how many times have we seen that happen beautifully? And I will tell you, we've seen the hypothetical there with LA. Mm -hmm. We have not actually seen a specific example where maps were intentionally used 
at the convening to come to common understanding of the problem. But there's power there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Steve? No. He's afraid to disagree <laughs> with me. Well, and I think, you know, um, I, I thought one of the other things that was really provocative about the conversation is it seemed that the policy directions you could go are really limitless. Um, you know, I've got a couple friends up here a few rows back that uh, work with an organization called the Home, I'm talking to you, Alyssa, the Homeland Security Advisory Council, and they've been doing some incredible work uh, through a platform they developed called SALUS around mapping around natural uh, and man-made disasters. Uh, that is really one of those places where people need to come together. Um, it seems like there's really no limit. Where in the surveys were, are, are there policy areas where as you were doing your interviews, you were surprised to see uh, mapping platforms used to address a particular policy issue that you didn't, you hadn't thought about? Let me quickly answer two questions you didn't ask and then I'll answer. <laughs> you know, I'm inherently I a, a politician at, at heart. Um, one is that, um, I mean, inherently in our presentation is the following, right? Governments organize vertically, people live horizontally, right? And so people do not live in the Parks Department or the Sanitation Department mm -hmm. or the Police Department. They live at 25th and Santa Monica, right? And stuff happens at 25th and Santa Monica. And the way we set up government ensures that we're going to miss some insights about that location, particularly if it's not if we're not finding a way to listen to folks who live in there. So, so that's, that's one set of, I'm on, indirectly on my way to answering mm -hmm. your question. The second is the following um, that Kate briefly mentioned, which is that inherent in this is that we actually understand the problem we're trying to solve. So, um, you know, when I was in New York City, the woman in charge of uh, social services is Linda Gibbs, who you you know, mm -hmm. and um, you know she walked into her. You didn't use the homeless. You know. No. Okay. So she walked in the office one day. She had a, she had uh, run homeless services. She's a brilliant person and a good friend. And then she became deputy of social. Security. And when she was in the homeless area, she walked into her her office and said, "Okay, let's come. Let's get together. What what is uh, the value we're trying to create? Right." And her, her, her staff said, we're trying to create shelter for those who are homeless. And she looked at them and said, no, that's the definition of failure. The definition of value is when we keep people from becoming homeless, right? That doesn't mean we, sh don't, we shouldn't be providing shelter for those who should, mm -hmm. but measuring the number of beds for shelter folks kind of misses what, so, so you can argue about whether she's right or wrong, but the point is that conversation across the collaborative, what is the value we're trying to create will drive many of these issues. And then if we think about um, whether we're mapping transitional housing, we're mapping the spread of uh, opiate addiction or overdoses, right? And we, and we look at that in terms of, of, of where are the pharmacy prescriptions up? Where are the, the, the uh, uh, EMS uh, 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 men and women responding to, right? Where, where are we going to? Where do we find linkages between that and and um, overdoses? So 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 mm -hmm. in many of the emergency services today, we're seeing that mapping for purposes of rationalizing response time, but more importantly, for rationalizing predictive preemptive interventions. And I was just going to add that some of the most effective work has been done in disaster response, mm -hmm. using mapping, mm -hmm. getting people to the table exercising sort of the job that they were set up and then disbanding when the need was over. Well, and that actually brings up another thing. As, you, as it relates to some of this, it, it seems like this is, it seems like you're proposing, and by the way, this is my last question before I go to you, so I hope you have questions ready. It seems like you're, what you're proposing is this is the way, uh, this is a way by which government and cross-sector collaborations can be convened. Uh, at the same time, as you just mentioned in the uh, example around disaster or crisis management, there's also there also can be much more of a project-based way of looking at these issues as well. Did you see in some of your surveys that 
or or interviews or discussions that some of this tended to be more project based versus this is the way that we're always going to handle uh, a particular set of policy issues. Well, I've written a, a couple articles for governing. You read? Do you read my columns <laughs> yeah. on emergency response? Right. So. How do we think about collaboration in emergency response? You know, and, and we found over the last several important uh, catastrophes in, in the country that a digital platform allows collaboration both for purposes of report, you know, because the official reporting often is not accurate. And so for purposes of reporting, for pur purposes of organizing uh, collaboration, for purposes of organizing intervention, however, the best of those uh, collaborations are ones that, before the catastrophe, have, have at least thought through kind of what those relationships are. So they're, they're project-based in terms of how we're going to help people who are, who are harmed by this horrible event, but they're also planned so that when the problem occurs that the, the, those associated with the project response can leap into action. And I was going to say, I, let me just make sure I got the question, which mm -hmm. is where where have we seen cases where they tend to be shorter term mm -hmm. in nature? Exactly. Yeah. So the instances that, that I can recall tend to be around education and awareness initiatives and several in the sustainability. So there's a great push to make the information available, but there aren't necessarily coordinated actions that are envisioned at the other side. And so when the person that is driving that desire to make the information available loses their energy, and I'm oversimplifying it, mm -hmm. then the thing tends to die a quiet death. And, and so, and I've seen that in education and awareness campaigns for right. the most part. But I wouldn't skip over the fact that um, visualizing life in a community allows the folks in the community to have information upon which they can run advocacy campaigns, right? One definition of origination is how do folks get together to uh, ameliorate in inequity, right? So trash pickup in LA is uh, unequal uh, in certain communities, right, in terms of speed, mm -hmm. right? Well, the mapping of that uh, produced changes in LA, for, you know, for example, and uh, Seattle has some uh, really impressive maps on equity, right, and, and the eff effect of the, the gentrification on various neighborhoods. That can drive a narrative which is a, a, which is a call to public action. So I think the, the front end of this is very important as well. Excellent. Okay, let's open it up to questions. We have uh, questions from the audience. I know that we have some policy students here, and I did not promise extra credit for this service, but suffice it to say, um, welcome questions on this presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I'm curious about incomplete data sets, incomplete maps, incomplete information, because one criticism of this approach could be death by comprehensive plan. Um, how, how can we be cross-sectoral while at the same, same time recognizing that there is, that we are working with, by definition, incomplete information and that nobody has the full picture? and that that shouldn't paralyze, we shouldn't stop until we get all the information into some sort of perfect form and then proceed. We have to proceed, we can't wait, but we also can't proceed simply on the basis of one sector's vision. Well, you know, planning can equal paralysis, right? Um, uh, the same, your, another version of your question is, um, my guess is that even as good as Rick Cole is, that not every performance measurement in Santa Monica is perfect, right? And that, and you know, if he says, I'm interested in this, he's going to get too much of that, right? Because it's just the way life works. But it's probably a lot better than it was yesterday before he started measuring, right? And so um, I've got this, uh, uh, I volunteer to help a, 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 a case management homeless shelter group in Indianapolis, and the guy who runs it is just a really terrific guy, and he kind of read one of my articles and said, I want to get all the data I can from city, county, state. I want to understand all that data, and, and then it'll improve the way I help homeless folks. Well, that's impossible, right? You can't get all the data. It's in different formats. You don't know where people are. They move around all the time. 
So the better exercise, we concluded, was let's get your case managers and the county and city case managers together in a room and say, okay, what information about a neighborhood or about a family would improve your ability to intervene earlier before the problem becomes chronic, right? How, what if you could find out that the water was turned off before the family became homeless rather than after they became what? So I, I think the, the process of organizing some 80-20 rule, right? What's, what's the stuff you'd want to know? It, it, when, I, when I first did, this is an old story, but just really quickly. Um, uh, when we first did predictive analytics in New York City about a, a fire, it went the following way, right? So a family of five died in a fire from an illegally converted building. I called, I knew we were going to get calls about, did you know about the building? I called the fire department and said, have you ever heard of, uh, about the problem in this building? They said, sure, but we get 50,000 calls a year. We went out and knocked on the door and we couldn't get in and whatever. And I said, called the building department, I got the same answer. We got 35,000. Right, then there was some guy in the back of City Hall who said, just, just give me four weeks. And he went and got available information, right, mortgage, mortgage for foreclosure notices, property tax delinquencies, crime calls the date the building was built. And he came back and said, I can improve by 1,000% which of the, of the complaints about a building is most likely to lead to a fire, right? A thousand percent. So now we just assign people to resolve those three to 400 or worth whatever they were, the number worked out. Right, so my only point is start with the easy data that drives action and then just keep iterating it. Hmm. What questions? Don't feel compelled to ask questions. <laughs> Hi, uh, Patrick Outwater. So last week, our new governor um, budgeted, uh, proposed $36 million for a new Office of Digital Innovation to tackle many of these sorts of challenges. Um, what role do you see for a state in enabling these sorts of collaborations across governments? There's been a lot of historical efforts with state mandates and some more or less successful. What would you say, like, top couple things that you would suggest we could do in California? <clears throat> Um, a little bit depends on what he's trying to, what the governor's trying to accomplish, but let me answer broadly. Digital innovation, is that, that mm -hmm. so, um, uh, y you can think about this as agency to agency and state government, you can think about this as government to government to government, right, state, county, city, and you can think about it as government to nonprofit. Each, so, so the, the big innovations come when people think across the agencies and across the sectors, which is the point of our presentation. And, and um, because you, you, you would assume, particularly, you know, California's got a pretty well-run set of bureaucracies. I, I use bureaucracies not in the pejorative sense, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so you would assume that they're relatively good with their own data relatively good with our own data, but probably not so innovative when, it, when disruptive thinking is caused by moving across these. So I would say kind of th th they, should, they should pick a set of goals that are important, right? Because it, it goes to the same question, right? Data for data's purpose is really boring. Data to solve a really important problem is pretty exciting. So they should pick a set of really important problems, improving high school graduation rates or, or reducing infant mortality or fill in the blank, right? And, and so that's one way to think about it. Second way to think about it, this is a serious problem in New York City, is that the state data systems are so horrible that they inhibit the, the integrated use of data for child protective service workers in the field, right? That's not quite the case in California because they have actually, they've done a lot of work. But, but I would say, what are the areas where the state could be innovative that would ripple down, cascade down through the various levels of government to improve the, the ability of city workers and county workers to do their jobs better. Then thirdly, I would say, okay, well, we have opportunity zones. We know areas that particularly are in need of services. Let's think about um, how we can support those services collaboratively. And, and I think, Kate, your, your, your thoughts about how the nonprofit world would link up with that would be helpful. Yeah, so, so one of the things that we've had conversations about, and I, and I alluded it to it earlier, you know, people talk about, well, there's lack of data literacy, but what really exists is a lack of bandwidth. And so one of the things that we've explored is, is there a role for data or data intermediaries mm. that sit between whether it's the government 
or groups. So there are lots of associations of nonprofits where they come together. And so is there a role for these intermediaries to provide both the sort of translation function, but actually the application function, because that's where the bandwidth is so lacking inside the nonprofits. You've got the data, I've translated, but then what does it mean and work? And so that I think is something for large aggreg aggregators to think about. Are there translators or intermediaries? So Kate and I were in a city not to be named in Northern California, we were actually in several last week. And the mayor had told us about, uh, I'll make the mayor without a gender. I never so that, this very um, <laughs> the mayor named a, a homeless service provider that, that they thought was the best in the area. And we met with that person. And she was great that ran the organization. She said, I get 10% overhead costs, right? And, um, and from that 10%, they have to make up a bunch of shortfalls. And then Kate said, well, how do you think about your use of data? And she said, well, um, I got a stack of Excel spreadsheets, and I wish I had something better, but I don't have any time, and at 10%, I don't have any ability, right? And she's the best in that particular community, to Kate's point, right? So, so the, the uh, one, if you want to drive innovation, you could drive uh, intermediaries who could uh, power some of the nonprofits to be more effective with the information that's available. And to be clear, are you saying those intermediaries are nonprofits created for the specific purpose of being an intermediary? Or they are, they are existing inter uh, associations of nonprofits. So you think independent sector, all of the, right. Uh, right? Or you think about there's a group called the Alliance for Strong Families and Communities to which virtually all of the large and many of the small human services agents, they're a Perfect intermediary. Mm. So it's organizations like that. Very good. A couple other questions. Yes. Hi, I'm Ashley Trim. I'm the director of the Davenport Institute at Pepperdine. And I had a question, some to what you were saying, Kate, about the importance of really coming to a common understanding of the problem that then relates to Steve's example of the probation. Um, issue and challenge that you ran up against in New York. And I'm interested in ways of navigating what happens, particularly in situations where there is a fundamental disagreement about the problem. Um, and I'm thinking of that largely in terms of where the problem may seem in one sense to be a public safety issue and in another sense to be a social justice issue. That seems like, but there's, there's others particularly where one group of people may be seeing it as, again, the social justice issue, and another seeing it as a very practical, here's a problem that we need to solve for the sake of the rest of our residents. Are there ways of navigating that? Are there ways of bringing data to bear? Because it seems like those are the situations where one side looks at data in one way and the other in another way. How do you build those bridges? So do you want to answer that or shall I? So, I, mean, it, I mean, Part of the presumption, and I wish I could give you a very specific answer, is actually getting the players in the room and looking at those data together, co-located, so that you can begin to ask the questions of the data. So we have this, we have two views, and then so begin to break down, sort of peel the layers below. What are the underlying questions that might support understanding the gap in perception? Now that that's pretty gobbledygooky that I just gave you. I don't have a particular technique. Steve, do you have a particular well, example? You, know the, um, you could do this a couple ways. One, you could run through some hypotheticals at the beginning point of the origination of the collaboration. The second is um, there, um, I don't remember where this was. We just gave an award at Harvard to a city like Las Vegas or Salt Lake, or a city that had, had trained its police officers to be more sensitive on their interventions with street folks and thought they weren't succeeding, right? The training was insufficient because the perspective of the officers was just different. And they decided they had to put two folks in a car. One was a social worker, one was a police officer, and they would respond together until they both understood their each point of view and the mm -hmm. officer became better trained and the caseworker understood that there are certain circumstances that couldn't be resolved that way, right? Because, you know, people are 
um, they're they're uh, they're a product of their kind of context, and so you have to work those through pretty carefully. I think the the other point is that we talked a lot about locational data, but data analytics is a lot better, and we we are better able to identify which folks keep getting brought to jail who really have mental illness program problems. We're really, be you know, if we can do this work much more discreetly than we are and begin to sort out those who are off their meds contrasted those who are really dangerous, right? And so I would say it's both this co-location that Kate mentioned, but it's also a better use of data discreetly to try to identify individuals who need one type of help as contrasted to another. The more and more I hear both of you speak and, and engage with some of the work that we do at, at Pepperdine and consulting with governments, the, the more it, it, it keeps coming back to me that the most important skill that somebody in public leadership has is the ability to ask the right question. <laughs> and, and that is so true of, of data, right? Um, but it's also true of, of what is the problem. You know, I, I just as a well, brief story for me, we did a, Several years ago, we did a budget, a public engagement budget process in, in Salinas, and at the end of one of these w budget workshops with about 150 residents, uh, somebody got up, one of the residents said, I really had a great time tonight, learned a lot about where my tax money comes from and where it goes to, but really all I care about is I want a city where my daughter, after she graduates high school, can come back and live in Salinas. And I remember sitting, ne standing next to the city manager and mayor at the end after she said that. And I remember going to the mayor, Dennis Donahue, uh, no longer mayor, but uh, still a friend of mine. I said, Dennis, did you hear that? And he said, Yeah, the woman wants her daughter to come live in town. I said, No, no, no. Every policy decision you make from now on, you need to tie to that. And to me, that that really is so much about. Uh, being creative around the, the questions that we ask of our data, as you mentioned before, in that uh, that that uh, tendency for for buildings to to be on, to catch fire, um, and where those problems lie, you need to ask some pretty uh, uh, creative questions there, but also tying it to the story of where you live, because as much as this is all data, it still is, as you said, people don't think about government as departments. Most people who live in Santa Monica don't even know the difference between a school district and the city, much less what the county does and the state does, much less where their tax money comes from or goes to, but they know what they like. And so finding a way to, to merge what I call the narrative and, and the quantitative is, I, I think, is really such an important uh, public uh, public leadership skill. So we have time for one more question. Pete, you asked for questions from students of public policy. <laughs> I've been on the Santa Monica City Council over 20 years and I'm still studying. <laughs> Good. Good. I noticed at the very end of the presentation, the last slide said that what stands in the way of implementing this is a lack of resources and bandwidth. Now, councils are used to allocating resources. Hmm. Bandwidth is a newer concept. How do we use what you're proposing to bootstrap bandwidth hmm. to make it possible to increasingly use these techniques, <laughs> given that right now our resources are overclocked. Everybody on our staff is working their tail off. How do we create more bandwidth in the short term to create improvement that creates even more bandwidth in the longer term? Great closing question. So let me do this briefly, um, but I appreciate your experience. Um, first, in order to drive innovation, folks generally need all of the following assets. They need data, they need time, right? Because if they're busy 18 hours a day picking up the trash, and they need a little bit of money. Not, they may not always need the money, but they, those are assets that are most often connected to innovation. Point two, as you know, uh, current budgeting leaves very little discretionary money for innovation, right? It's just hard to scrape it out of something else. And you've been burned too many times, would be my guess, with a pro forma that said, if you invest a million dollars here, we're going to save $2 million here, and then 
you invest a million, you don't get the two million. But at the same time, there, there are investments in innovation that will produce those savings. And um, uh, the, I study governments around the country and the ability to, to scrape a little bit of money out of the current budget to dedicate a team of folks that is where the innovation delivery team concept came from who, who have that time makes a difference. And so I would just you know casually suggest without knowing whether you do it now that you have a innovation uh, investment committee and there's a small pot of money and a little bit of time, and uh, they submit ideas to you and Rick and four other folks, and if you like one or two of them, then you give them a little bit of time, not a lot of time, and maybe a little bit of money, not in terms of personal money, but resources for data or whatever, and, and then and you give them a little bit of a rope because I, inherent in our, our presentation is that their government is root, routinized and yet with a little bit of money, we can identify 80-20 rules and outliers in every area. Families most likely to get in trouble. Kids most likely to get abused. Water drainage problems most likely to occur over and over again. And so applying the 80-20 rule, I think you could probably save some money. You just have to be convinced that it's the right thing to do. Thank you. With that, please thank, join me in thanking Kate and Steve. And I'd like to welcome up uh, Santa Monica City Manager Rick Cole to close us. So uh, Pete talked about the Pepperdine um, motto being putting public back in public policy. And I think um, what we ought to start with is anchoring um, the public back in public places. Um, I care a lot about the words we use. And place is one of those rare Latin words that actually comes from the Greek. Um, we usually get our words from one or the other, but the Latins actually borrowed this word from the Greek, and, and it's the same word um, that in Spanish we know as plaza. It's the same word uh, that we know in French pronounced differently, but the place Vendôme, the place de la República, the place de la Concorde. Um, place is really about an outdoor room. That's really where we get that is... Is, it's, a, it's by its nature public. It was applied to public squares, public avenues, pu public gathering places. And so when we think about place, it starts with that core. The, and so we have this 8.3 square mile place of Santa Monica that is made up and anchored by these public rooms that we share that by the nature of things are the place where business and government and families and institutions of faith and nonprofits, that, they, that is anchored in a real place. That is not just a collaborative that, that lives in the sky. Um, in fact, it comes down to this 8.3 square miles and the places that make up this 8.3 square miles. And so to the point about creating bandwidth so we can utilize these tools and utilize these avenues of collaboration and the technology that is now at our fingertips, we're working on that bandwidth. It, and, and Tim Dodd is working on teaching people about how to measure outcomes. And CCS, our Community Cultural Services Department, has hired um, their first data scientist to work on uh, mobilizing uh, those things. We have long been a pioneer in GIS, and our ISD, uh, Information Services Department, um, is working on a, on a wide range of, of data uh, challenges, including one uh, where we uh, have partnered with USC and a private entrepreneur to map and share data around homelessness, one of the key issues facing our community. And so we're adding staff, we're adding training, we're adding projects, we're adding partnerships to create this bandwidth so we can utilize these tools. 
But what this adds up to is we have a long way to go. And what it adds up to is our aspiration to be an urban laboratory, to be a place where the academic world, the nonprofit world, the government world, the business world, the civic, community, family, institutions of faith worlds, instead of living in silos, are actually collaborating and utilizing um, data in order to, first you have to get the data, then you have to visualize the data, but ultimately the whole purpose of getting and visualizing the data is to use the data. And so we aspire to be that preeminent urban laboratory of where we are at the forefront of gathering the data, we're at the forefront of visualizing the data, we're at the forefront of sharing the data across sectors, and ultimately at the forefront of using the data to improve the well-being of the people who live in this 8.3 square mile place. So thank you, Pepperdine School of Public Policy, Thank you to more than 30 staff from our organization who are here um, to learn. Thank you for those of you who braved the rain who are not connected either with the city of Santa Monica or with um, Pepperdine um, because this is the essence of what an urban laboratory is. That we take the finest minds in America from Harvard University to Pepperdine from coast to coast and we try to, in real time, understand and then apply the very best practices in the entire country and, in fact, probably in the entire world, and then be a beacon and a model, as we have been so often to other communities, where communities who are less blessed with the political will and the resources than we are can learn from our example. That's what we aspire to do. We aspire to think globally to act locally, and to be that urban laboratory that others can learn from. So thank you, Pepperdine. Thank you all for coming today. And uh, we'll all go out into the rain.